how we know This is how we know what love is Just one look at your cross And this is where we see This is where we see how love works For you surrendered your all How we know that you have loved us first And this is where we chose to love you in return For you so loved the world that you gave your only son Love amazing, so divine We will love you in return For this life that you gave For this death that you have Welcome to Connected Online Bible Study. My name is Sandra Hartage and I am your teacher. I thank you for stopping by to study with us and I just pray that the Lord will bless you as you uh, learn about the life of Joseph in this manner. And before we start our lesson, uh, I would ask that you pray with me. And so if you would, bow your heads where you are and let's go to the, word, uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Holy Father, how I do praise your holy name. You are an awesome God. You are in control of all things. You are in control of our lives, and you have a plan for each and every one of us. Father, I just pray that you will help us to understand what that plan is through the power of your word. Father, I pray that as we study the life of Joseph, that you will reveal to us afresh something new from your word. I pray for these individuals that are watching this, and I just pray a blessing upon each and every one of them. Speak to them and, and draw them unto yourself, Father. I pray a blessing upon each one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. In our previous lesson, we found that Joseph had been placed in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He soon found favor with the warden and was given many tasks and, and duties within the prison to complete and to oversee. He was in charge of the prisoners that were in the prison uh, concerning their food and, and daily activities. And um, he also met there the cupbearer and the baker. They had a dream the same night. Both of them individually had a dream the same night. And Joseph was able to interpret um, those dreams for the cupbearer and the baker. If you'll remember, the cupbearer was the uh, one that would be restored to his previous position as the, uh, cu the chief cupbearer for the Pharaoh himself. The baker, on the other hand, was going to be executed in three days. And both men were, it was done to them exactly as Joseph has said it would. In ancient Egypt, the Pharaoh was considered divine. He had a direct communication with the gods, with a little g, of the Egyptians. So it's a little unusual that he didn't have that communication going with the gods that he could himself interpret the dreams that he had. But when that fell short, he had a guild of magicians and wise men and sorcerers who were there for the purpose of interpreting signs and dreams and concocting remedies for whatever situation or specific type, various types of um, magical problems that might occur. The task of the magicians and wise men was to interpret signs and dreams and concoct remedies for various types of medical problems through magical means, including spells for souls to escape punishment in the underworld. Many assume that the dreams of Pharaoh were beyond the scope of Egypt's wise men, and yet, in some way, it is remarkable that these magicians could not have come up with some kind of logical explanation using their own well-known symbolism. Egyptians believed the gods communicated through dreams, but didn't communicate the meanings. Dream interpretation was carried out by experts trained in the available dream literature the Egyptians and Babylonians compiled dream books with sample dreams along with a key to interpretation. 
They had records of past dreams and the interpretation of those dreams. These men were a priestly caste who occupied themselves with the sacred arts and sciences of the Egyptians. The hieroglyphic writings, astrology, the interpretation of dreams, the foretelling of events, magic, and conjuring. They were regarded as the possessors of secret arts and the wise men of the nation. But not one of these could interpret Pharaoh's dream. In ancient mythology, the goddess of fate was Hathor, the cow goddess. Believed at the birth of a child, Hathor would appear in all seven forms and decree the fate of the newborn child. Pharaoh would have known that seven cows was an omen of the future of Egypt. The Egyptians were very concerned about cleanliness, especially personal cleanliness. They removed all their facial hair, including uh, the hair on the head of the men. Although facial hair was common among the Asiatics, Egyptians rarely were depicted with beards. The only one that had a beard was Pharaoh, and his beard was a false beard. It was actually glued to his chin. After being summoned by Pharaoh himself, Joseph would never appear before Pharaoh unless it was in a clean state. So Joseph shaved his head and his face lest he offend the Pharaoh. After Joseph has interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and Pharaoh has pronounced that Joseph would become the vizier of Egypt, he is honored by a royal Egyptian ceremony called the investiture of power. During this ceremony, three things happen. Pharaoh gives Joseph his signet ring. He places it on his finger. This was a symbolism of the investiture of authority and power as the royal seal bearer. This signet ring would be used by Joseph as, as a seal upon decrees that had been made. He was given fine linens. The fine linens that they talk about here are, are a sign of uh, royalty and great prestige. They were the finest woven fabric. They were semi-sheer and very thin. The average Egyptian did not have access to the thinly woven fabric that it talks about here. That was a sign of royalty or great prestige. The golden collar was bestowed upon a public servant for distinguished achievement. It was uniquely an ancient Egyptian custom, and it was referred to as the conferment of the gold of praise. And Pharaoh bestowed another honor upon Joseph. He called him the father to Pharaoh. This meant that Joseph was a royal advisor, someone who had done the king a very special favor. And it spoke about an advisory relationship between Joseph and Pharaoh. Our lesson begins in Genesis 41, and we will study verses 1 through 46. The previous lesson found Joseph in prison for a crime he did not commit, and where he meets the chief cupbearer and the baker and interprets their dreams. How long was Joseph in prison? We don't know. Joseph was in prison for two years after he interpreted the dreams of the chief cupbearer and the baker, as in Genesis 41 reveals. He was sold into slavery when he was about 17 years old, in Genesis 37, 2. And he was 30 years old when he became vizier of the, uh, to the Pharaoh, in Genesis 41, 46. Altogether, he served 13 years with Potiphar and in prison. The record does not tell how long he served Potiphar before his imprisonment, but that he worked his way up to be the overseer of the prison implies some period of time before the butler and the baker joined him. So it's likely that Joseph was in prison at least three years and possibly much longer. In Genesis 41, verse 1 through 4, it says, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile. 
when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker to the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I have never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of good abundance are coming through the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of the Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as the second in command, and people shouted before him, Make way, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name zephniath Pania, and gave him Ashnath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph's new name was zenith Pania. Some Egyptologists explain that Zephniath means food man and Paneath means of the life, which stands for the chief steward in the realm of the face of famine. These words have also been interpreted to mean abundance of life, Savior of the world, revealer of secrets, God's word speaking life. The Lord had spoken and he will live or the one who knows. Pharaoh next obtained a suitable wife for Joseph, suitable in the eyes of the Egyptians, that is. The girl chosen for it was the daughter of an Egyptian priest. The girl's name was Ashnath, which apparently indicates something like dedicated to Neith, Neith being the Egyptian equivalent of the goddess Minerva. There is little doubt that she had been brought up in the polytheistic Egyptian religion. Her father, Potiphera, meaning essentially the same thing as Potiphar, given by Ra, the sun god, was actually a prominent priest in this religious system, located at the temple of On. Of course, some knowledge of the true God, Genesis 41, 38, had continued into the Egypt of Abraham's day and into the time of Joseph as well. So it may be that it was not as difficult for Ashnath to transfer her faith from Ra, the sun god, to Elohim, or Jehovah. Joseph with was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. So let's look at the life of Joseph. Joseph had a lot of ups and downs in his life. He was the favorite son of his father. He was hated by his brothers. He was thrown in a pit sold into slavery, bought by Potiphar. He prospered in Potiphar's house to the point of being appointed overseer of all of Potiphar's possessions. He was lusted after by Potiphar's wife. He was scorned by the same woman when he refused her advances. He was accused of rape, thrown in prison, promoted to a high position under the warden, interpreted the cupbearer in the baker's dreams, and then asked to be remembered to Pharaoh, only to be forgotten for two years. Finally, he's remembered by the cupbearer when the Pharaoh had two dreams that couldn't be interpreted. Joseph interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams. He's made vizier of Egypt, given authority over all of Egypt, and he's given a wife as well. All of this happened in 13 years after he was sold to Potiphar. Did Joseph have a reason for being angry with God? Did Joseph feel sorry for himself? Would you? God had a plan for Joseph's life. We can look back on the scripture and see that all along, God had planned a very special position for Joseph and that he had trained Joseph, nurtured him, given him opportunities to learn how to assume the responsibilities of vizier. All along, God had designed a plan for Joseph's life, a divine plan with a very special purpose. Does God have a plan for your life? Does God have a plan for you? Let's look at some of the scriptures that God gives us and you decide for yourself if God has a plan for you. In Proverbs 16, 3, 
it says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. Isaiah 23, 9, The Lord Almighty planned it to bring down her pride in all her splendor and to humble all who are renowned on the earth. Isaiah 14, 24, The Lord God Almighty has sworn, Surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will happen. Isaiah 28, 9, All this also comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, whose wisdom is magnificent. Psalms 31, 1, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of His heart, through all generations. Psalms 106, 13. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. Psalms 107, 11. Because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And in Psalms 139, verse 16, you saw me before I was born and scheduled every day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. Does God have a plan for your life? Yes, He does. And as Christians, it is our responsibility to be in the Word, to know what a Christian is supposed to do and a Christian is supposed to act like. That's part of God's plan. We are also to turn our life over to Him and be obedient to His leading, knowing that He takes care of us. He does prosper us. He prospers us in the faith. He prospers us in our walk with Christ. That doesn't necessarily mean that he, His plan is to give us lots of money. That's not what He means here. It's to prosper us in the Christian faith so that our faith grows the experiences that Joseph had on the surface not considered to be good ones. Uh, nobody wants to be thrown in the pit, and nobody wants to be accused of something they didn't, a crime they didn't commit. And no one wants to go to prison. But those times in Joseph's life where he was in those situations, he was learning, he was growing, his faith was growing, and he was growing in knowledge and wisdom. He was learning about life and how to respond to whatever situation that he was in. And his path is not finished yet. Joseph will soon meet his brothers once more, and he will have to confront the hatred and the, and the anger that not only did the brothers feel, but he has to confront the anger that Joseph felt all of those years. Does Joseph forgive? We'll see in the next lesson. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord give you wisdom and understanding as to what He wants you to do. Have your ears opened. Be in the Word. Listen carefully to what He tells you to do. You have to pray and you have to ask God to show you the way. And He will. Now, He will not show you that the overall plan, the big picture. That only He knows. Besides, if He, if he told you what was going to happen, you probably would turn around and run the other way. So he only reveals to you step by step what he wants you to know and what he wants you to, to do. Because if you're faithful in the least of these things, you will be faithful in greater things. Thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate your time in spending with us in studying God's Word. Next week, our lesson will be on Joseph's administration and how he plans and prepares for the famine that is coming.